Good evening, everyone. Hi, everybody. Ready to do some book club talks again? Oh, it, it's good to be <laughs> back, Sarah. It is. I am so excited and seeing all of the faces and comments coming up on the screen. I think everyone is just as excited for this evening as we are. I know some are. old friends that we've not yeah, seen for several weeks. I agree. I yeah. agree. It. I cannot believe that since quarantine, as we'll call it, yeah. this is our third go-around doing book club. Can you believe it? And this time, it's a little mm -hmm. different, right? It's very different. Sarah, i got to ask you, what inspired you for this book? Because I am so glad you did. Right. I don't tend to uh, read uh, novels or even uh, fiction. fiction at yeah. all. I'm, I'm sort of a technical guy. Yeah. So to sit down and read this, wow, how refreshing that was. I hope you folks out front mm -hmm. out there uh, are, are finding the same thing. And so... Interesting. Very oh interesting. my God, from the first page on, I was just drawn in. It was great. Yeah. Natasha Boyd, who is the author of The Indigo Girl, and as everyone sort of joins the chat, it's fun to see you all commenting where you're, uh, where you're joining us from, but this is one of those novels, The Indigo Girl, that um, came up in my research when I was trying to find a book that not I'll did the last one we won, but it would be in a strong sort of competition to be as entertaining and educational. Um, and I sort of felt like we did two pretty serious history books back to back. Oh, and I love them. I love them too. As educators, yeah. we love history because it's it all ties into what we do on a daily basis here at the studio. Um, but I felt like I needed something a little bit more lighthearted. And when no. a hi historical novel came along that featured a young woman from South Carolina who became one of sort of the mothers of the revolution, um, she is sort of given all the credit for bringing Indigo to South Carolina in our pre-revolutionary period. And I'm embarrassed to say, and I have died with Indigo many, yeah. many times, I yeah. did not know this history, folks. Uh, this is just so enlightening. Mm -hmm. And because I don't tend to read this type of historical fiction, yeah. um, I just sat down and thinking, uh, how much of this is true? How much is it fiction? Right. Um, and it makes you just want to know more about it and do more research on it. And mm -hmm. you really have taken mm -hmm. that on. That's sort of that's sort of how I took a spin on this is that she's laying the framework for the entertaining part of learning this woman's life, um, Eliza Lucas, and spins it so that it's it's very entertaining for us. But at the same time, it gives us little windows into actual um, factual pieces of um, history that were happening during this time period, including colonization yeah. of Antigua and yeah. the diverse or um, the sort of period of agriculture where they were being very experimental to find things that could be exportable goods to create revenue within these new colonies. And um, it kind of takes us down this journey, but it opens the door for a whole <laughs> lot of continued research. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you, mm -hmm. but I, I don't necessarily uh, boast about knowing all the different places in the world, mm -hmm. but I thought about Antigua and I thought, I should know this. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Like, <laughs> Antigua is one of those places that you think about and you sort of say, um, I'm, I know it's in the Caribbean yeah. somewhere, but, but where is it? So in some of the research that I had gathered, it was to do a basic search of Antigua. And um, what I found is that there's a very, very old history mm -hmm. of um, colonization there. In fact, Wikipedia um, is boasting that there had been people residing there since 2900 BC. Get out. Yeah, so we're talking about 5,000 years. And of course, um, I'll put in the chat section for you guys the actual web address for this if you want to do additional reading. Oh, sure. um, but there were several different groups, including a group that migrated there from Venezuela, some native folks, and then of course the colonies later on. So it's had it's had several sort of um, people who have made it their home and created their own traditions there, and then moved along. Doesn't it just blow your mind when you think about somebody getting <laughs> right. in a boat right. and saying? I'm just going to go to a far off land and see where this takes me. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're using the term boat very loosely, I think, because let's face it, uh, we're talking about glorified canoes at this point. Sure. Um, but 
I encourage you guys to go on here and read a little bit more about the history of Antigua and Barbuda because um, it really does lock interconnectedly into the story that we're talking about mm -hmm. and how Eliza's life was um, sort of molded even though she had parents who had grown up in England. She had a very different birth and um, childhood and then moving to South Carolina was even a bigger difference. And with yeah. her father being in the military, mm -hmm. stationed there, he takes his family and they settle in. She falls in love with the island and the people there. That's exactly yeah. right. That's one of the other things that I love is that in the first five chapters of the book, I'm going to pull a picture up here of Eliza so you can see because I think a face puts a lot into perspective. But what a beautiful woman. Eliza was a very, she has a very gentle looking face. Yeah. And um, when I read the words that Natasha boy, the author, frameworked around her. You can see in looking at her portrait why she wrote her as this character. She's not timid, but she's certainly more creative, not like the others, as they might no. say. Um, but she has a beautiful disposition and certainly shows all of those fine um, upper class breeding characteristics, but she gets her hands dirty. And so this is a very lovable character in the book that I... I immediately related to. Well, hats off also to her parents at the time period. I mean, <laughs> when you think about 1750, yeah, mid 18th century, yeah, that they put importance in educating their children. Oh, sure. You know, yeah. even to the point where uh, her brothers, or her sister, mm -hmm. they're put back on a boat and sent to England for right. to be educated sure. and then come back to the colonies. Afterwards. Although in her case, she has the realization in knowing that that education was the to prepare her to be a suitable wife, right? To support someone That's else. That's true. However, being in the United States and seeing that this was very different from the England she grew up in, and they use the phrase several times through here that, you know, people tended to do, jump in and do jobs that they normally would not have done. And she's wholeheartedly embracing this and yeah. hoping that those pressures to be married by a certain point in a certain social class may not need to apply to her and she can continue her education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just a remarkable woman. She yeah, was. Different parts in the book. And I'm sure you folks have found the same thing as you're reading through this. Mm -hmm. um, she's saying, you know, if we were still back in England, I'd be married off by a certain time period and the education would be wasted. Yeah. Because she could... Uh, well, she was basically somebody's uh, property. And right, exactly. as you read this and living at this time period yeah. and knowing how capable you and your sisters are versus this young lady. Mm -hmm. And um, if she doesn't take over this plantation, she's got to get married. Exactly right. And we don't want to be a burden on our parents for the rest of our lives. So we need to now, make some clever decisions. For those of you who have sort of done a little bit further reading or one have already done a little bit of extra research on Eliza Lucas, and I'm using Eliza Lucas because that that's the part in the book that we're at now. This is not her married name. Right. Um, this is her father's name and the legacy that she's carrying on. But Eliza Lucas, um, Wikipedia gives a really nice introduction um, into what it was like from birth all the way through her life. Um, but I was certainly interested in seeing where life took her. Um, I had heard rumors, you know, along the way that, um, uh, what do I want to say? George Washington was the pallbearer at her yeah. funeral. And those sort of things really? <laughs> spec spoke volumes to the impact she had um, during these revolutionary Rebellion periods. Um, but I sort of wanted to figure out end of life. Where did she end? And how fortunate to find um, through a very quick Google research that Eliza ended up right here in Pennsylvania, believe it or not. Um, through using a website called findagrave.com, I was able to locate the, um, the site of her grave. <laughs> Turns out she's right here in Philadelphia. Well, not here in Philly, but Pennsylvania. And so having access to... Um, her final resting area was really, really exciting. I'm going to put a copy of this um, uh, website in the in the comments section that you all can make your way over and navigate to this page. Um, but St. Peter's Episcopal Churchyard is where you would find her. And guess what? Lo and behold, as I find this information, turns out I needed to take a trip today. Wait till you hear this story. Folks. To Philadelphia. And 
when I say I was heading to Philadelphia, we were able to acquire a loom for the studio um, because one of our students is downsizing and she decided to keep five of her six looms <laughs> and I purchased number six. Uh, but it turns out when I put in the GPS, she was only about 35 minutes from this church and I told Dustin yeah, we yeah. absolutely <laughs> had to make a detour or I was going to regret it, especially knowing that today we were kicking off book clubs. So it's been a little of a whirlwind day as I made it to I'm surprised go. you're still standing. <laughs> I was highly motivated. I'll tell you, guess what? what? I can disassemble an entire cram book loom in 37 minutes. And that's loaded in the van and ready to go. <laughs> Score! <laughs> right? Yeah. So what I was able to do is put together... Um, a little bit of a montage of the graveyard. So this is right downtown Philadelphia, walking distance from the Liberty Bell and oh. Liberty Hole, um, very oh prominent gosh, area so of history. Philadelphia. Yeah. And if you're from that region and you know the downtown area, um, it's almost right on the corner of 3rd and Pine Street. Otherwise, use the, the link yeah. that I gave you in the comments section. Um, what, what was so fantastic about this is that um, the graveyard is so beautiful. It has these gorgeous brick walls all the way around. And um, as we entered the graveyard, there are these beautiful brick pathways that sort of lead all around oh, the perimeter nice. of the building. Um, and it really tells of the time period because many of the gravestones um, have sort of seen the test of time and no longer you can see the, the names on the graves. Um, really interesting um, headstones as well. I was surprised by the variety. Um, some were very long and flat to the ground. Others stood very prominent. This oh one my. is um, almost a sort of flattened pyramid shape or an elongated triangle. Really I'm not unusual. sure. Very unusual. Unfortunately, it was really difficult to read any of the inscriptions on there, but I had to sort of document it. Um, but oh this picture right here, I want to draw attention to because just behind where we're floating on the screen here is a magnolia tree. And at the base of the tree is Eliza's grave. So she basically has a view right of the church. And I just thought that was so beautiful. Uh, Dustin was able to get a picture of me, but this, it was an unmarked grave, um, but they have put a brass plaque in its place so that you actually can um, see where she, she resides. Mm -hmm. But, it's amazing, Sarah. I know you're under a time pinch, mm -hmm. but you walk in there, <laughs> yes. you know, and we're looking at hundreds of graves in there. Yeah. I turned to Dustin and he said, where should we start? And I said, I don't know. I'm just going to go down this path. And it was the first grave on the right side. I mean, you can see how the proximity to the, the church when we looked at the previous picture. Um it makes me just think. Yeah. Yep, that was supposed to happen. Exactly. Let me yep. let me take some of these off here so that you can see. Yep. So right under the magnolia tree, I made up that little pathway, and you could see the brass Aww. plaque right beneath the tree. Um, but what a beautiful resting place for her to reside. And mm -hmm. don't you wonder how many prominent people uh, attended that church yes. in history? Walk those same pathways. Yes, absolutely. And I wonder how many people go to those sermons. Uh, you know, sermons, well, not during COVID now, but when they are open. Mm -hmm. And they've never even walked through that cemetery. We are so excited about the Indigo Girl. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, We're like, going ape. <laughs> I did. It's not something that I do as a regular sort of form no. of um, oh, a hobby to visit graveyards, but I felt like I'm, I'm paying homage to this woman. That's she right. is the focus of the next eight to 10 weeks of my life. Yeah. And so I wanted to go and sort of say, thank you for just being this really awesome woman. And thank you for contributing to our birth of a new nation, right? She was part of that whole evolution. And last time we had book club, we talked about the history of wool and how we were so dependent on England for everything. Up At this point in South Carolina, when she is yeah. here, we only purchased finished cloth from England. There were no mills established. There were no dye houses. I, I don't even think there were commercial spinneries at this point in 1730s. No. So, so we were highly reliant upon that. And England was 100% dependent on France to purchase all their indigo from. Yeah. So this was kind of the key to open up a huge wave of, of revenue since I read 
that this sold at a higher price than gunpowder per pound. My so valuable gosh. commodity just to make yourself um, adorn with your favorite color. color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wore blue especially for tonight. Good for you. I love it. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Now, as we go through the chapters here, we are going to sort of open some doors into history and we're going to talk about um, what was going on in South Carolina. We're going to review back to some of the history of Africa because a big emphasis of this book is talking about how Eliza embraced the workers and her childhood friend, Ben, which yeah. I, I, I've really developed a soft spot for Ben and you're rooting that someday maybe they'll be um, rekindled <laughs> again. But it's just, it breaks my heart <laughs> for them to have lived in a period where she had this wonderful childhood friendship right. But because of race differences and social status differences, they, they could never be equals. Or, and he truly was property. Um, so she couldn't even use him as a resource. Um, and he had been privy to generations of knowledge that had been passed down. And she wanted that knowledge. She did. But uh, when, didn't she just love it? I mean, as children, and they're playing. You know, yeah. and he's throwing berries at her to get her Staining attention. Staining her linen yes. her dress. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That was, that was just so sweet. And you can, you can imagine, I think Natasha Boyd did a really fantastic job painting that scene so that we could be there in that moment because it would have been challenging for a young white girl who lived in a prominent household to befriend somebody. Oh yeah. Who, who was the help's children. Um, yeah, I, I really do. And well. I love Natasha Boyd's writing yeah. because as you go through there, and I'm, I'm sure some of you folks felt the same thing. I mm -hmm. was in South Carolina in that sweltering heat. Mm -hmm. You could just feel it. It yeah. may be 28 degrees outside my door right now, but <laughs> I, I was taken back in time. And, and you just sort of know that you're there. I mean, you smell the wood smoke at the fireplaces. You, you, you can almost imagine their clothing. Sure. But also what the climate must have been like and how sweltering. Without air conditioning, I mean, I am just so... Fully sweat. clad to the wrists and ankles. It, it, exactly. Mm -hmm. She just writes so well. I think she also <clears throat> has done a very good job in these first five chapters of sort of painting the scene of some of the um, key characters that are going to follow her through the <clears throat> book, including some of the other um, farm managers. Mm -hmm. um, what's the nasty guy's name? Mr... Starts with an S. Strat. Come on, everybody in the comments section, Mister Mister Not Nice Guy. Yeah. But she paints him as it's like such an ugly man, and she does such a good job foreshadowing what could be a, um, what can be a challenging hurdle for her because immediately he has no respect for the fact that she will be making decisions in her father's place. She's a woman. She's a woman. She's sixteen years old. She's sympathetic <laughs> to the African slaves right. in that. Um, she is. Um, well, she wants. To she's adamant. Books. She's adamant that there will be humane conditions, <laughs> right. and she sees them as her equals, um, necessary to the growth of the colonial period, um, but certainly meant to be treated humanely and not um, tied to a whipping post. Mm -hmm. And that's very symbolic, I think. And the fact that the father leaves and it still hasn't been taken down really left me a little bit uneasy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you know that overseer, the manager. Yeah. He's not a nice person. Yeah. But on the flip side, thank you very much. It was Mr. Stat and Karen. Thank you so much for helping us out. That's embarrassing mm. that he's burned in my memory and I've already refused to yeah. remember his name. Um, but also the Pinckney family. Oh, yeah. I love them already. Now, there's some foreshadowing here. If you know anything about the history going forward, you can sort of see where it's going. But... Um, I truly love this couple. They sort of remind me, like, if there was a bohemian next-door neighbor couple, this would be them. <laughs> that would be them. Because they're very forward-thinking <clears throat> for the time. They encourage her and they indulge these whims. And yeah. they really are curious about what her plans are for the future in her father's presence. And unlike her mother, who is still clinging to these sort of um, social norms of she has to be presented to society, they, yeah. re they really could care less. And I, I just love them more and more every time the page turns. Mrs. Pinkney yeah. must have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Just to sit down and have a cup of tea with uh, separately. Yes, yeah. I'm sure Pinkney. without her mother <laughs> sort yeah. of interfering. Um, and so I look forward to see how those relationships develop and, and sort of are supported through the rest of the, yeah. the story. Um, 
Now, oh, Mary has a little comment here. She said, PBS just aired, let me see if I can get it all on here, The Long Song, a masterpiece theater. Did you catch that? I saw it. About slavery yes. on sugar plantations in the 1830s, Jamaica, including slave rebellions. So that is something really important to put up. They Thank have you, mentioned Mary. several times about slave rebellions. Now, this that you're mentioning is 1830, so this is still 100 years later. But a lot of folks lived with the fear that if you didn't have a firm hand, mm -hmm. your slaves would rebel and sort of um, take over, right? They would lose control. But here's the thing. I think the Lucas family had a very different view on it. And Mr. Yeah. Mr. Lucas was adamant that um, if you lead with violence, it only leads to violence. I think that that correct. was the quote. Somebody correct me if I'm, if I'm off on that a little bit. And... Um, you and I att attend Quaker meetings, so that's right. not very far from most of the doctrine that we what talk we about all the time. Um, but in this story, I think it's really wonderful because, again, it's supporting this idea of how she truly feels about her staff. And right. those. I think that that foreshadows that trust that's going to be needed for her to gain the necessary knowledge for the indigo to work. Correct. Right. If you don't have those strong bonds and that trust, it's it's well, going it's going to be, be gone. It, it, that's right. She yeah. needs to have that information. Yeah. 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 So I have another um, page that I want to share with you, folks. Let me flip over to my web view so you can see this. Um, the Charlestown County Public hmm. Library has a really wonderful page, and I'll put this in the comments section for you on Indigo in early South Carolina, and this again. Um, Eliza is mentioned almost immediately in here because she gets all the credit. And there's a really neat um, uh, recording here that I encourage you to go in and listen to, um, as well as more about the actual economics behind it and why it was so important. Um, and one of the things that I thought was poignant in here is that Indigo had no value to the early settlers except as a commodity for export. And I think that that's really important to consider because, and I'm quoting here right from the page, as a plant, one could not eat, smoke it, feed it to the animals, or make it into clothing or build houses of it. The process of the dye stuff was time consuming and labor intensive, which of course meant expensive. Mm -hmm. And again, there were no dye houses. There were no mills in the United States. So it's purely export. So it was a big risk. And there weren't a lot of farmers that had, well, there were zero farmers that had um, experienced it with it because it was not a crop that they were making connections to from uh, what we would consider going home. Does that make sense? Correct. Like we knew how to make potatoes. We knew how to um, grow corn. Uh, but indigo was not something that was grown was in England. Foreign. And it was a trade secret. So um, I, I think that this was something that not everybody had on their radar. Yeah. But, you know, I just got the feeling, you know, she's so gutsy and she's so knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. At 16 years of age and having such a vast knowledge of botany. Yeah. Uh, again, brought on by the people that she had met in Antigua. Benoit. Yeah. yeah. And his grandmother. And his mm -hmm. grandmother. Yep. And then she does befriend a neighbor uh, and tries getting some indigo seeds. But, they, you know, they talk about, well, on this plantation, this farm, it may grow, but the soil may mm -hmm. not be correct for this one. But she is so determined to save her family's Yes. properties. Yeah. Now her father has... And not even um, save it. Like, he's literally leveraged this land oh, I know. against his career. And it must have been such a terribly stressful time for him. Well, his wife is mad. Right. Well, <laughs> she's getting left behind. And yeah. I think that she has that realization that they don't have an equal relationship. Uh, Marie did throw up here for me the exact quote on page 26. Thank you, Marie. Um... She does not see herself as an equal. And I'm sure that, again, because of her um, upbringings in mm -hmm. England, she had fully embraced that. But to see it then shifting that power and giving it to Eliza, she's very uneasy about this. And all she keeps talking about is for the brother return so things can go back to normal. She does not see this as a springing board. She's not proud of her daughter. In fact, I think there's a little bit of an embarrassment. And a little jealousy. Yeah. 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 Like she's constantly apologizing for Eliza for having thoughts and having ideas. She's wonderfully outspoken. Mm-hmm. 
especially for that time period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Know? And I, I, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. I think she's a little jealous of her daughter. I think perhaps, so. You know, her daughter's well educated, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps more so than what she was. Yeah, yeah. So she feels in a know, different way too. She's in, in a worldly way, not in a book sort of way, mm-hmm. but in a way that the mother creatively can't think about a future, nor does she I think I desire for society to be any different, mm-hmm. but for it to just continue in the traditions that she's comfortable sure. with. Yeah. Um, I have one more page that I wanted to direct you to. This is, I found, um, about a um, story of a man who grew up in South Carolina. And when he was a young boy, he actually came across an old indigo vat pit. And what I love about this is that um, as you visit the page, um, you can really see the details in the picture that along the walls of the brick, there are blue stains from the indigo being used yeah, over and over and over again. And what was something that they just, as a boy, came across while they were playing in the woods um, really was something quite historically poignant. And I thought that was kind of neat to be able to get a little closer look into. Well, you look at that and you almost wonder if it isn't the foundation of the building. Right. But, but the dimensions are, are bizarre. I mm-hmm. mean... Even I think a child could recognize the fact that this is not quite um, an ordinary looking. Right. Yeah. With the blue staining on mm-hmm. there, probably wondering, you know, what's going on there. Yes. But as we go on into this book, I hope that you um, are intrigued enough to look a little bit into the dying of indigo. Maybe this is the first time you've ever thought about it or explored it. But um, in, in Japan, Africa, uh, Asia, India, you know, all over the world, mm-hmm. people are dying with indigo, and it's often done in vats. And mm-hmm. so, this was a vat I'm sure. taking where they would yeah. have thrown the, the plants in and fermented them. Uh, it is quite the process, folks, if right. you've never done it. Very messy. And oh, yeah. one of the things that I think Eliza has going for her is like her intrigue is. Um, I think spurred a little bit from memories that she has. And of course we know that she loves botany and Mm -hmm. the strong connections to some of the slaves, but um, she's not pressured by the societal differences that she's willing to get down and dirty and learn Mm -hmm. these things. But she knows just enough to know that she doesn't know the right things. And And it's like, you don't know what you don't know. She knows enough that she knows the process is complicated. She knows that there is an extreme time factor involved. She knows you got to get out of the field before it goes to flower. Um, But beyond that, she's not sure why you need to do that, why the time sensitivity. And those are the things that she needs to find out. And, And now she feels like there's a little bit of a time factor because probably within the next three years when her brother returns... She's going to be pressured to marry. And if she can't prove to her father that she alone has been the reason that these um, plantations have been successful, it will easily be handed right over. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure for a 16-year-old girl. And yes, I understand that, you know, girls were often married at 16, 17 years old. We just, we've been binge watching probably for the second time the Bridgerton series. And she's sort of in the same series. Society has pressured her that she needs to marry well. Um, but unlike the first season of Bridgerton, um, she doesn't really care if she's anything no. other than a wife and a mother. Um, I think that um, this this is sort of laid the groundwork for a she lot is more a interesting things. She's going to do it. I, I agree. Yeah. I'm interested in the comments section for folks to make comment of what was your favorite part of the book so far. And of course, we've only really looked at five chapters, but there's enough in there that has either sparked information that you already knew or you did some continuing research on the other end. So please go ahead and put in the comment section anything that you'd like to share with the rest of the group. It could be a fun fact about Eliza. It could be about your love of indigo dying or um, maybe they just think it's a good read so far. We're always... uh, (laughs) Kelly said she just started Bridgerton. It's weird. There's 
for some reason, it's there's some parallels here for me. I guess it's the social factor and her age. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, we love it. I love the girl in the yellow dress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's she's wonderful. So Marie said she loved when Mrs. Pinckney asked, "How did anyone ever figure out about dying properties of indigo?" And that's true. Is that not something we talk about about all the time? Oh, (laughs) it must have just been a mistake that something happened upon. But again, this is an example where Eliza says, no, no, I don't think they just happened upon it. It's not like poke berries that leave a stain on your shirt. you got to work really hard and know the plant intimately to know that it just didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the chemistry that's involved with it and how... Um, a little bit like we have pyramids in Egypt, we have pyramids and that same sort of structure happening mm-hmm. simultaneously in history. Um, it's very, very uh, mind blowing in that case. You got so, it. So, um, you know, when I think about how indigo came about, indigo's being used in Africa, indigo's being used in Asia. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, continents apart, yeah. but they're all finding the same sort of thing. And she wants to get Ben back. She does. She asked. Somehow or other. You know. Oh, God, I felt for her. Oh As she's God. saying goodbye to her father, she realizes Please. there's two big things happening here. I have this last minute thing I need to pitch to you before you go because she can't text him right after he leaves port. Right. Um, and so she knows that she has a very small window and he's going to be sending back seeds. Just maybe she can rekindle this really wonderful friendship with Benoit. And as an added bonus, glean some of this really wonderful information that she knows he has as a young man. Um, but Eliza, she's also... I'm sorry. You know, uh, he's been sold to another sold. plantation. Well, Dad, you don't even think back. of that. I'm like, oh, my, oh my gosh. God. I mean, it's just sold. Your life. But, um, but you know what? He made a good point. By selling him to somebody who had an indigo plantation, he gave himself security that his knowledge was going to be valuable to his owner. He was not That's just exactly sold to right. somebody to be a laborer um, or put on a ship and sent to haul in, you know, the mast. Um, yeah. So he did a kind thing, but now he's he's really unreachable so far, so far. Um, now, Kathy has a comment I threw up here. It says, several people grow indigo here in the U.S. Um, Roland Ricketts in Bloomington, Indiana, on faculty at IU grows Japanese. Yeah, so there's a lot of, I think that Penn State University has also done lots of um, studies in indigo, but on a uh, massive scale production, the thing, just like wool, there has to be a deciding reason why indigo is not grown anymore if it was so profitable. Mm-hmm. And we can give that to a chemist who came along in the 1850s who invented synthetic indigo. And so now... We now, now we don't need that. But um, on large scale productions, yeah, unfortunately, indigo just really isn't um, uh, isn't isn't done on the mass scale anymore. You know what? Ruth has a question here. What was the plant that Ben saved Eliza from when they were um, beaning each other with berries? I love that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know I that they no ever said he just you know did the sign and knowing this from Antigua, it's probably nothing that botanically we're familiar with here. Um, but that's really interesting, you know, especially if you're a plant person, you always want to know what was that plant, mm-hmm. um, Ruth. You could probably, but without more information about the size or the shape, I can't give you any more information there. Google poisonous plants mm-hmm. in Antigua, and uh, let's see what comes up with that. And remember, this is yeah. a fictional novel, so. It's added for drama. It probably may have been loosely based on something, but Dang, it may never true. have happened. I know. We want to think that this is like a real-life real. <laughs> account. Um, but Eliza Lucas, interesting enough, she is one of those people that there are, I think there's four volumes of letters that she wrote throughout her lifetime that have been archived. And uh, I will look it up, but I think one, I think the State Museum in South Carolina or Charleston has those original letters. Um uh, Jan saying that she grows Japanese indigo. It's easier to grow and easier to process than um, the ones that Eliza was using. Yes. And we've now learned that, but think about the time period. Um, it would have been a long time till she got her hands on some Japanese indigo. But you're right. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we have no problem growing Japanese indigo. It's very easy. I've grown it in my it's garden. Prolific, yeah. And if ever you want to get your hands on some, there's a lot of great growers in the area yeah. And on our last meeting together for book club this year, or for this for this session, I should say, not year, 
Um, we're going to be showing you how to sow some seeds because it'll be the perfect time period for our zone here to mm -hmm. start uh, sowing those seeds. I'm excited about that. I really am too. Uh, there's comments going like crazy, so I have to sort of... Um, Ooh, what does this say? Mary Ann has a comment. In Outlander Season 5, Episode 10 or 11, I love that she knows that, yeah. the Fraser family indigo dyeing fabric, same period. Interesting correlation. That, yeah. That's true. It shows its popularity and its necessity um, for, um, for sort of showing societal status sure. at this point. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I missed any other good ones in here. I'm sure they're all good. I'm trying to read through them so quickly. Um, so Kathy said, I'm excited to see how she and who learns about the dye process. That is an interesting That's point true. because, you know, when we talk about these vats and learning how to make it in a packageable format that they can mm -hmm. export it to England. At this point in the story, she assumes that it's perishable. It won't even make the journey based on what her previous experience is because she's only ever seen it go from field to directly into the dye pot. Right. Um, there's going to take a time period of experimentation where she'll have to learn how to make it into a drier cake format for exports. I can remember seeing, mm -hmm. Kathy, uh, photographs of African indigo. And after the fermentation process, they make it into like what looks like the size of uh, a baseball, a little round sphere, and that can be dried and saved for years and years and years. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. It's like a whole dye process in itself. Yeah. So Robin is getting inspired. She uh -huh. says that this book club came along at the perfect time, and she plans to start a dye garden this summer. Oh, good well, for you, Robin. Yes, Robin, this is so fun because I'm sure that you have a lot of friends in this chat section who have grown indigo. Um, depending on the region that you're in, uh, ask questions. We'll offer some advice or any experiences that we've had. And um, if you have any questions, please put them in the group. Can I just put something out there? Sure. Robin, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know where you're calling in from, but if you are interested, there's a lot of plants out there that produce uh, what they call indigen. Mm -hmm. So it's that blue pigment so it's not just the indigo plant. You can get it from other sources. And if you remember, uh, in Scotland, uh, they grow a lot of woad. And somebody had given me woad seeds. And I thought, oh, this will be a whole lot of fun. Only to find out <laughs> that it is banned in many states. Woo! It's a noxious weed. I have it growing in the bricks, in the sad sidewalk, and in the patio. It's <laughs> everywhere. So He has a stone driveway, and he just pulls him out. He says, oh, the woes of woe. And, and I'm pulling, pulling it, it out. out. So if you would like some, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to warn you. Uh, but come on down. I'm happy mm -hmm. to give you some. Yep. Yeah. So when I was talking about Elias's letters, Donna threw up here in the comment section for us that her letters were eventually published in the 2000s for reading. And I'm assuming that... If they were published, that they're available on, you know, to the free market, probably through a museum source, that they were archived and digitized. Um, <clears throat> let's see down here. Who am I missing? <laughs> okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, people are commenting about the letters. Okay. Now, as we go on and we start looking towards next week, I don't want to keep you guys too long tonight because we can be a little long winded. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be looking at about the next 50 pages. And as a review, you can always visit our blog. Um, and I will put the reminders up in each event that's posted on our Facebook page, um, <laughs> listing the pages that we'll be discussing next. Please do some research of your own. This is such a fun way for us to share and explore sure. information. Um, this is what the chat, chat section is about. Um, but as we go through the next chapter... We're going to dive a little bit deeper into her dad is leaving finally. And so now the reality sets in that she's got to go back and sort of put her boots on and I get know. to work. In a few minutes, he's going to be boarding that ship and he's heading out. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to know if she ever sees him again. You know, he's going to Antigua. Does he come back to the plantation? Yep. What happens is he's, you know, keeping the Spanish off. Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting read. So, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, Sarah, I brought some books up. I don't know if you wanted to share those or not. We can. With uh, our viewers here. We can. Well, you know, we always bring books to the table because we love our library and we love the resources that we have available to folks. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? Maybe what we'll do, since we've already gone, you know, more than our half hour into this, 
let's save these book discussions. I'll get them worked up um, and take some photos of the covers so people sure. can get their hands on because some of them are in print and some of them are not. So we want to give you ample time to source those right. used copies out. And some of these are um, sort of research-based books. Some of them are formula-based if you really want to know about the dye process. Yeah, it's a whole lot of fun. Yeah. Maybe we'll turn you into indigo dyers after this. But I'm looking forward to the next few chapters in here. I am. I yeah. am. I hope you all stay warm. Tomorrow we are going to be putting together the Cranbrook in the studio Yay. while the snow comes down here in Pennsylvania. I think we're supposed to get another five to eight inches. That's but true. Yeah. all of our students are here at the Ridge snuggled in their warm beds for beginning weaving this week. So we I've will be exhausted them. Yep. He has. It was yeah. the it was the Wednesday night. Learn to plan your own first scarf project day. <laughs> so I will go down there this evening and start checking threadings. Yeah, I think they, I don't think you're going to find too many mistakes. I'm very proud. Of <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. That's excellent. I really want to thank all of you for being here. This is one we of my this. most <laughs> fun things to do. And we look forward to getting together with you every week. Um, if you have any questions, please make sure you continue to check back in the chat section because our students are great at helping us along and, um, Helping be educators themselves. Um, if you have additional content you want to share, the comment section will stay open for the life of the, the uh, broadcast that we're putting out here this evening. So you can go back, you can share it with your guild and all your friends. Um, and otherwise, we'll see yeah. you next week, 8 o'clock. Sounds good. Same time. All right. I Enjoy hope you all have a good evening. Week. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.